A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 332. And we are on the session seven of our Oculoplasty module. Today, we have the pleasure uh, of having Santosh Navasar again with us today. And he'll be teaching not just for one, but for two hours straight today. And he'll be covering two topics. The one that he <laughs> left uh, in the first session, uh, the one which with which we kick-started the Oculoplasty module, the practical anatomy of eyelids part two. That will be the first thing. And also covering the evaluation of congenital ptosis. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and over to you. Thank you. Good evening. I think in the last class I stopped short of orbital septum, isn't it? Yes. So I finished up to medial canthal ligament and lateral canthal ligament and stop short at orbital septum. Now let's cover orbital septum, mullers, levator, lower lid retractors, tarsus, little bit about blood supply, nerve supply and lymphatics in the next one hour. Okay, Titi, what do you know about orbital septum? Uh, so it's a thin connective tissue membrane which uh, separates the eyelid from the rest of the orbit. It originates as uh, uh, around the superior orbital uh, rim and uh, where uh, and then um, spreads out into the upper lid and the lower lid uh, in the upper lid it uh, it attaches uh, superior to the levator aponeurosis and in the lower lid it uh, merges with the capsule palpable fascia okay more or less accurate but if you want to be a little more detailed you, it can be defined as a thin fibrous membrane delineating the anterior boundary of the orbit. It is nothing but an extension of periorbita, which blends finally with the levator aponeurosis in the upper eyelid and capsulopalpable head of the inferior rectus in the lower eyelid. So, this beginning point of orbital septum is arcus marginalis, which is nothing but a fusion of the orbital septum with the periorbita. It is a soft tissue landmark. It's not a bony landmark. And when you do orbitotomy, when you approach the orbit, either from the lit crease incision or from the subrow incision, when you dissect the periosteum, you see arcus marginalis as a bright white line. You can have an arcus marginalis approach to orbital biopsy as well, where you can easily biopsy the lacrimal gland without having to reflect the periorbita. Orbital septum is medially adherent to the anterior lacrimal fascia and inserts to anterior uh, so it's a medial canthal uh, tendon. Isolating the sac from the eyelid and the orbit, it also it gets inserted to the anterior lacrimal crest. So any lacrimal sac infection can be isolated to the anterior orbit because of the septum, which is an anatomical boundary between the eyelid and the orbit. Laterally, it gets attached to the lateral canthal ligament and the vitreous tubercle, and it blends with the lower lid retractors and levator aponeurosis, as we already said. Now, what is important is to understand that there is something called suborbicularis fascia of putaman urist. So, it is a condensation of an orbital septum, a specialized condensation, said that if you tuck it during levator surgery, it may cause lag of thalmus. Now, this is how orbital septum actually seals off the orbit from the components of the eyelid and preceptal tissues. Except for an area here on the medial side, it's generally sealed. Otherwise, the areas of defect include wherever there is a nerve, artery or a vein that enter and exit. Those are the areas of defect. Apart from that, it is pretty much a sealed structure. Although it is very flimsy, it does create a boundary between the anterior structures and the orbit. Now, when it gets attached to the levator palpebrae superioris, it, it is a kind of a sloping attachment. This is how it slopes, gets attached to the levator aponeurosis, about 6 to 8 millimeter higher than the upper edge of the tarsus. It is grossly variable. In Asians, it may go on right up to the anterior surface of the tarsus. In Caucasians, it may go say six to eight millimeter higher than the upper edge of the tarsus. 
You know, this attachment has various anatomical configurations. Shafali, do you want to explain that? What are the configurations? It's all written there, but do you want to explain how is it practically important the way septum meets the levator aponeurosis? What are the practical implications of this? Uh, so practically is when we are dissecting the layers by layer by layer in a tosis surgery, we should be able to identify what exactly, like which is which structure is exactly the septum. Because if we actually uh, see the septum should have the uh, fat, which is kind of like reflecting uh, behind it. So we should not confuse it with either levator or some other structure uh, during the resection, especially. So that is a practical importance. That's fine. But what about these, these five different types of septal confluence? with the levator aponeurosis. Septum doesn't always attach like this. This is typical, isn't it? Mm. So what is creeping attachment? Oh, not very sure. <laughs> Subhav knows it better. <laughs> Subhav? In one of the surgeries we had discussed today. <laughs> Uh, if the insertion of the septum to the levator is diffuse, it gives a D-shaped configuration. No, no. Suppose septum hugs the levator like that with very little fat in it or if the fat has displaced superiorly, that's called a creeping attachment. So you'll not readily find a bulging pad of fat under the septum. You'll have to lift up what looks like the thin layer septum under a microscope. And if it lifts vertically, whereas the LPS is horizontal, then you assume that it is a septum and make a very guarded, careful opening into it. Then you land upon the levator and sandwich between that septum and the levator of neurosis would be a thin layer of fat that is creeping attachment. Whereas P-shaped attachment is when, of course, it is a creeping attachment, but when it has a bulge like that, which is towards its insertion, that is P-shaped attachment. D-shaped attachment is a dome like that. This is mostly found in Asians or Northeastern population of India, where there is a huge mound of fat right under the bulging septum. That is a D-shaped attachment. But as a small D is when the anterior surface is or the anterior part is creeping and the bulge is slightly higher up. This is seen in elderly individuals where there is fat atrophy or a deep supratarsal sulcus where the fat is slightly more posterior and the creeping attachment is on the anterior surface of the levator. B is nothing but a double hump, hump like that, which is very unusual. So if you open the hump here, then you'll have a long way to reach the levator of neurosis. If there is a hump like that, a B-shaped attachment, you have to open the hump very close to the levator aponeurosis so that you readily reach the levator aponeurosis and you won't have a mound of fat lying on the anterior surface of the levator aponeurosis. So it's very important that when you do suborbicularis dissection and retract the orbicularis with a Demers retractor, you identify what kind of septal configuration is there which is getting attached to the anterior surface of the levator aponeurosis and plan your opening of the septum to identify the levator aponeurosis and carry on further levator resection accordingly. If it is creeping attachment, you have to be very careful because if, if your cut is bold, you may be actually damaging the levator aponeurosis. The pad of fat that is cushioning uh, the levator from the septum will be very thin or not existent at all. With rest of the configuration, it is only an issue of pad of fat prolapsing. And if you don't want much of fat prolapsing and if it has to be more contained, then you have to identify the contour of the septum and open it up accordingly. Now, the next is pre aponeurotic fat pads. These are pre aponeurotic extension of the extra con Before that, let's talk about um, what are the uh, practical implications of orbital septum. Subhav, do you want to enumerate what are the practical implications of orbital septum? One is that it contains infection from any of the anterior structures not getting into the orbit that's called preceptal cellulitis. It prevents preceptal infection from spreading I mean, orbital cellulitis because it's an anatomical boundary. Although it's a thin boundary, it is a fairly straight boundary. And many patients, if you identify them at the state of preceptal cellulitis, do not progress onto orbital cellulitis if you initiate appropriate antibiotics. What is the second 
second practical importance of the septum it uh, holds the part of fat and mm. uh, weakening of the septum as an aging can lead to prolapse of the orbital part of fat and uh, subsequently we deal it in cases of left right yes. left of so left fat would indicate a dehiscent or a weakened or a thin septum what is the third implication um third is uh, in cases of orbitotomy we have to be careful while uh, uh, rightly identify the septum and not directly go through it uh, we directly do not want to open the periorbita fine okay so if you are very careful with the septum especially if you are dealing with a lacrimal gland tumor don't open the septum carelessly and don't injure the levator open it as high as possible and then very carefully retract the septum and land on the anterior surface of the lacrimal gland that is fine anything else what if there is bleeding post prephroplasty if there is bleeding what will happen if you have opened the septum suppose you don't open the septum and do a transseptal blepharoplasty like radio frequency assisted contraction blepharoplasty not excisional blepharoplasty then there is no chance of bleeding getting into the orbit but if you open the septum then anterior bleed can get into the orbit okay. anything else um yes, any diseases that are typically preseptal not orbital if you have a prominent eyelid crease in a child with thickening of the preseptal tissue and rubbery thickening of the preseptal tissue then what do you suspect or in an adult with a yellowish hue of the skin with rubbery infiltration of the preseptal tissue including skin what do you suspect xanthogranuloma xanthogranuloma like in a child it would indicate that it is not infection inflammation but infiltration such as even leukemia for that matter leukemia lymphoma any infiltrative disorder would be limited to the preseptal tissue unless it is a combined orbital and the anterior disease the preoperatorial fat pads extensions of the extraconal fat surrounded and delimited by the anterior septal elements and as you rightly mentioned we weak septum would cause fat prolapse these are the surgical landmarks because once you open the septum and retract the preoperatorial fat pads then you land on the levator palpebris superioris or the lower lid retractor depending on which lid you are operating most important implication is that septum should not be sutured even in a patient who has trauma septum if it is sutured or in patients with levator resection or in orbital biopsy or orbitotomy if you suture the septum what complication would you expect intracranial lag of thalamus and down gaze lid lag lag change in contour of the eyelid depending on how to what extent have you sutured the septum suppose in a patient with lid laceration you find that there is fat prolapse under the orbicularis what do you expect that the wound is deep you have to definitely retract the fat look for injury to the levator aponeurosis and suture it appropriately especially if it is a transverse cut in the eyelid or a transverse lid laceration if it is a vertical lid laceration again if you find that fat is prolapsing when you have kind of explored the wound that means that the septum is damaged and deeper injury should be ruled out and if at all levator is damaged you should suture it appropriately even last time i mentioned that there is what is called subbro fat pad that can descend down over the septum and that should not be confused for the septum so these are some of the practical implications what do you understand by this picture so it uh, shows the distribution of the fat pads Mm-hmm. in the upper lid there is a medial and a central fat pad okay. and in the lid we can uh, it's a medial central mm-hmm. and lateral fat pad which is typically divided uh, the medial and the central one uh, has inferior oblique mm-hmm. dividing it um, and the uh, yeah and the color also is uh, can color also- difference is mainly in the upper eyelid mm-hmm. especially the medial one is of what origin does it have a different origin than the central fat pad in the upper eyelid yeah neuroectodermal origin yes medial fat pad is of neuroectodermal origin and it is paler has larger globules and more fibrous septa whereas the central fat pad is mesenchymal origin 
now lacrimal gland is sometimes covered by the central fat pad and that happens in about 20% of patients so when you don't see lacrimal gland when you do blepharoplasty you have to be very careful you know exactly where the palpable lobe of the lacrimal gland is you have to be very careful in excising fat on the lateral side sometimes there is a fibrous septa that is bounding the lacrimal gland and there is coverage of the central fat pad on top of it so you have to be very careful in the lower eyelid whenever you do blepharoplasty you have to be very careful not to damage the inferior oblique and also arcuate expansion of the inferior oblique these are at an angle to each other this kind of runs from central to lateral whereas this runs from center to medial so this central fat pad is almost a triangular structure there is bulging medial fat pad and lateral fat pad can be ill defined it can actually spill over the orbital margin so some patients have a very pronounced lateral bulge in such patients you have to adequately excise the fat pad the clinical implication is that when you do lower eyelid blepharoplasty if you're not careful or if it is bleeding or if you don't identify the inferior oblique properly then you may injure the inferior oblique it is a good idea not to injure the arcuate expansion of the inferior oblique as well it is more pronounced in patients who have a bulgy eye such as patients who have a shallow orbit not northeastern individuals or patients who have a bulgy eye because of whatever reason then their inferior oblique is going to be more anterior and it could be found right at the orbital rim level otherwise it is slightly deeper and you don't generally need to see it if you're simply doing a conservative blepharoplasty if you're doing an aggressive blepharoplasty you will actually see the inferior oblique muscle and then you do what is called a seesaw maneuver you pick up the medial fat pad you pick up the central fat pad and lift each so they should move independently of the inferior oblique and when you move the medial fat pad the inferior oblique should not get tugged with it so you can use a blunt uh, instrument or a cotton tip applicator and separate the fat pad and its addition to the inferior oblique if at all before you start exercising fat for a aggressive inferior blepharoplasty now what is eisler's pocket i think i mentioned last time this is revision question quiz question it's an anterior pocket of fat that lies between the lateral canthal tendon and the septum on the lateral side so this this triangle of fat is called the eisler fat pad it may extend anterior to the orbital margin as well but generally confined to the level of the orbital rim this is just a curiosity question and it may cause lateral bulge and if a patient wants relief from it you have to explore for the eisler pocket and excise that particular part of fat now these are the deeper attachments of the septum these are limiting attachments you should simply be aware of that beyond arcus marginalis there is what is called supra orbital ligamentous addition and also there are additions elsewhere which will actually anchor the soft tissues to the facial skeleton and whenever it is lax the patient will have sagging of the tissues and these come in handy if this anatomy is known you comes in handy when you do face lifting what do you understand by this picture no response it shows the retractors of both the lids that are and their attachments to the tarsi okay so we are only showing here the muller superior sympathetic tarsal muscle and its corresponding muscle in the lower eyelid which is called inferior sympathetic tarsal muscle so what do you know about muller's muscle so it's a smooth muscle that mm -hmm. uh, begins uh, uh, at the superior orbital rim mm -hmm. just beneath the levator aponeurosis uh, sometimes the hypothesis is that it is actually the infer the inferior part is a superior orbital rim what is it uh vitnals when it uh, basically the muscle uh, the levator muscle um, converts into the levator aponeurosis just beneath that uh, the muller's muscle uh, will uh, travel along with the levator aponeurosis and mm -hmm. sometimes it is hypothesized that it can be a inferior portion of the levator muscle also sometimes it is hypothesized like that it is a smooth muscle 
uh, and it uh, yeah it travels along with the levator appendix and uh, basically it att attaches uh, above the tarsus 3 to 4 5 mm above the tarsus 3 to 5 mm above the tarsus is that so yeah. what is its innervation sympathetic innervation it's a smooth muscle and origin is supposed to be under surface of the levator palpebris superioris and anterior to the vitreous ligament it interdigitates with the levator runs downward for about 8 to 12 mm that is the range and thickness is very very less it's half a millimeter to 1 mm thick but it is quite broad 15 to 20 mm broad as broad as the levator aponeurosis and it always runs posterior to the levator palpebris superioris and inserts at the anterior superior tarsal border so if you look at this picture it is very clear that as you rightly said it originates somewhere around the vitreous ligament hugs the levator aponeurosis posteriorly runs across it and attaches to the anterior superior tarsal border and the, there is actually a fibrous tissue or areolar tissue that separates the levator from the mullers but that is very thin and similarly uh, areolar tissue layer separates mullers from the conjunctiva so you actually have a pain of cleavage but sometimes it is very difficult to do subconjunctival dissection sparing the mullers so whenever you do levator resection sometimes muller stays with the conjunctiva sometimes it may come with the levator palpebris superioris that particular maneuver is quite uncontrolled despite the best of your efforts during surgery. Now, this is a picture from a cadaveric dissection, which shows the Muller's muscle. You can see that this probe has been put right under the Muller's muscle. And you can see that it is actually getting attached to the upper border anterior surface of the tarsus, that is its attachment. And the fibers are fairly vertically oriented. It is a very thin muscle. And here you can see that levator has been resected up here. This is the levator palpebris superioris. And you can see this is the upper edge of the tarsus. And these diaphanous bands are nothing but very thin atrophic Muller's muscle. So this is from a cadaver dissection. Now, these are some of the theories about Muller's that it is actually called pre-tarsal fascia. Uh, and it is uh, a theory by Haramoto who says that Muller's is the muscle that actually suspends the tarsus, not the levator, and levator suspends the anterior rediments, including orbicularis and skin. This is a theory that is not uh, proven. This is controversial. Sympathetic innervation is already mentioned. It is from the paravertebral sympathetic chain via the internal carotid plexus. But how does this sympathetic innervation reach the Muller's is not very clear. It may come along some of the blood vessels, some of the sensory nerves and even along the levator palpebris superioris. These are all postulations. Exactly how the sympathetic innervation reaches Muller's is not completely traced. Its function is that it causes sustained eyelid elevation after levator lifts it for about 2 millimeter. But the current theory, theory is that it acts like a starter motor. It initiates elevation. And why is this theory? Because whenever a patient has Horner's syndrome, you have ptosis. If the actual function of the Muller's muscle is sustained elevation of the lid after levator lifts it, then you cannot explain this 2 millimeter ptosis adequately when a patient or mild ptosis adequately when a patient has Horner's syndrome. So if it initiates elevation, then perhaps that could be explained. So in any way, that is again a postulation that it acts as a starter for eyelid elevation, it initiates elevation and lifts to the extent of 2 millimeter. Why this 2 millimeter? That is because with adequate stimulation or contraction of the Muller's muscle, you get about 2 millimeter elevation of the eyelid. In a patient who has mild ptosis, if you apply phenylephrine or if you do phenylephrine test, then the Muller's would contract and it would lift the eyelid by about 2 millimeter, which is an indication for Mullerectomy surgery. So that is again a understanding. So basically Muller's lifts the lid, that is what is known, lifts to the extent of about 2 millimeter. This is the view from the back, this is again from Dutton, which shows that this is the Muller's muscle, which 
sends actually a slip towards the medial canthal ligament that is the central portion of the Muller's muscle attached almost to the entire span of the tarsus except for the lateral canthal ligament and that is the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. So it begins where the levator muscular portion ends and runs along the aponeurotic component and attaches to the upper edge of the tarsus. And inferior sympathetic tarsal muscle is a congruate of Muller's. It exactly mimics Muller's muscle in the lower eyelid. And it also has exactly the similar function. It causes lower lid retraction. So it, it is one of the retractors of the lower eyelid. So practical implications of Muller's muscle are that phenylephrine test, if it is positive, then you can do Mullerectomy. Then in Horner syndrome, patient has ptosis, mild ptosis about two millimeter. In thyroid disease, because of overstimulation of Muller's, patients have eyelid retraction. So some of the component of eyelid retraction in patients who have thyroid disease is contributed to by Muller's. And in patients who have eyelid retraction, you can do Muller's muscle recession. That is one of the surgeries that can be advocated without disturbing the levator palpebrae superioris aponeurosis. Another surgery in patients who have eyelid retraction because of thyroid disease is, of course, levator palpebrae superioris recession. Short of it, if a patient has mild or sexual eyelid retraction, you can simply recess the Muller's muscle. Okay. Now, before I show the slide, I'll ask you, talk about levator. Who wants to talk about levator? This is the most important muscle for an oculoplastic surgeon, right? You must know everything about this muscle. So, who wants to talk about levator for five minutes, non-stop? It's the main elevator of the upper lid. Hmm. It originates uh, at the lesser wing of the sphenoid and... Uh, uh, basically, when it travels uh, in the orbit, it is uh, horizontally when it traverses the orbit. It uh, At the beginning, it is four millimeter of width. At the mid orbit, it's around eight millimeters uh, width. And when it reaches the superior orbital rim, basically the muscle will uh, convert into an aponeurosis, which is a levator aponeurosis, and it descends down. So basically, the uh, and uh, typically the fascia around it will be thickened, which forms the vitinal, lig vitinal's ligament. So Wittnell's ligament is actually a check ligament and a pulley, which kind of like uh, transfers the force, uh, the vector force of uh, action of the muscle. So, and it descends down in the eyelid. And uh, uh, as it descends down, uh, as we talked about, it is accompanied uh, by uh, the Muller's muscle when it's descending and attaching to the eyelid. When in the orbit, uh, it is basically uh, when it's traversing horizontally, uh, superior rectus muscle is in close contact with the levator. Um, and uh, sometimes the fascial uh, sheaths are uh, uh, present around it. So making it the levator and superior rectus complex. Uh, that uh, actually explains when we actually uh, in the up gaze why the eyelid elevates. So that fascia around it, uh, making it the levator and the superior rectus complex. Uh, explains that function and it attaches to uh, the tarsus, the uh, anterior surface of the tarsus. Um, three minutes. I think that's fine. Um, you did well. The origin, as you said, less, less of wing of spinoid above the annulus was in supratabilateral or supratemporal to the optic canal. So if a patient has optic neuritis, the clinical implication is that the patient may also have ptosis or pain on movement of the eyelid. In addition to pain on movement of the eye, the patient with optic neuritis can also have inflammatory optic neuritis, pain on movement of the eyelid because it is very close to the optic canal insertion, origins rather. And the uh, width is, it's a very thin muscle, but it is very effective. You can see it's only four millimeter at origin. You should remember four, eight, 18. 16, 20, 24, 32. 8 millimeter in the mid orbit, 16 millimeter posterior to the orbital rim, 20 millimeter anterior to the orbital rim, 24 millimeter at midnals, and depending on the age and race of the patient, it may span from 28 to 32 millimeter at its terminal insertion to the tarsus. So it, it is like a funnel. So it starts very thin and then gradually it starts enlarging where it inserts into the tarsus, and somewhere here would be the Whitman's ligament right at the superior orbital margin.
length is about 36 millimeter there's no controversy about its length there is also a range 32 to 40 millimeter but length you can assume to be about 36 millimeter but the proportion of aponeurosis to muscle can vary aponeurosis can range from 12 to 18 millimeter and the length of the muscle can proportionately range from 18 to 24 millimeter in all about 36 millimeter some in some patients the aponeuristic component is longer in some patients the muscular component is longer sometimes there is a very indistinct blend between the aponeurotic and muscular portion the muscle fibers continue to travel along the aponeurosis sometimes right up to the upper edge of the tarsus the distinction is quite clear in about 50 percent of patients especially when we operate on ptosis so it's an abnormal anatomy anyway uh, it's very clear but in 50 percent of patients it's a very indistinct blend whereas witness is just an indicator that aponeurosis or mus muscular component has ended and aponeurosis has begun it's just an indicator witness has nothing to do with the transition of the muscular component into aponeurotic component you should remember that because some books write that witness is a junction of mus muscular component and aponeurotic component that's absolutely wrong witness has nothing to do with this transition it's just an indicator now this is the origin you can see levator palpebrae superior is origin and this is from a cadaveric dissection you can see that at the origin it's very thin four millimeter and it's gradually starts increasing in its span and it looks like a funnel and that is at its terminal attachment to the tarsus it is the widest there 28 to 32 millimeter now as shafali mentioned very nicely there is something called conjoint facial sheath it's a check ligament fibrous strands from the superior facial system anterior one third of the levator is posterior to the vitals envelops the levator and superior rectus and interconnects both results in coordinated movement of the superior rectus lps and superior fornix as a complex you left out superior fornix because some of these slips actually go into the fornix and these are called fornicial suspensory ligaments so when the patient looks up fornix becomes deep when the patient looks down fornix becomes shallow so that's because of the phonicial attachment of the levator and the same conjoint facial sheath that binds the superior rectus and the levator as a complex also goes to some of these slips go to the superior phonix and that's called phonicial suspensory ligament. Now whenever you do levator resection, when you're separating the conjunctiva from the levator posteriorly, one of the main complications of supramaximal resection used to be phonics prolapse. And that happens because you would have disturbed the phonicial attachment of the levator. So how do you stop yourself from disturbing the phonicial attachment of the levator? One is to not to dissect beyond say 10-12 millimeter in the plane between the conjunctiva and the levator. Second is the fibers are supposed to be vertical. If this is the appearance from the back, so this is the edge of the tarsus and you are separating the levator from the conjunctiva, the fibers are supposed to be vertical and as you dissect if the fibers suddenly become oblique and crisscross if you have suddenly an encountered a change in configuration of the fibers from vertical to oblique and crisscross that means that you are nearing the phonics if you just go through this area then you'll have a sudden release and you'll go right into the anterior orbit so if you see any change in orientation of the vertical fibers, you should stop immediately because you are nearing the phonicial attachment of the levator. Otherwise, you may have the risk of having phonics prolapse on the first post-operative day. That's just to show that, see, this is the levator aponeurosis. Somewhere here would be the superior rectus. And you can see that Conjoint facial sheath bind. This is the levator aponeurosis. Conjoint facial sheath binds the levator aponeurosis with the superior rectus, and somewhere here is the superior phonix. So, so superior phonix lies in between the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus muscle. So, this sheet uh, uh, septa actually attaches and holds the superior phonix steady and undetachable. 
So when you start dissecting in this layer, you can see that suddenly you are encountering something which is oblique. And that is nothing but the change in orientation of the fibers. And whenever you encounter it, if you don't stop here, you'd be detaching the superior phonics because you'll be disturbing those attachments. Now, this is a new surgery that has been described relatively new, which they call conjoined facial sheath uh, plication. So this is a surgery where uh, ptosis can be corrected by simply passing a suture and plicating the conjoined facial sheath. But this may harm the superior rectus because you're actually pulling on the superior rectus indirectly. Second is that if you're doing supramaximal resection, that means that you're going beyond the Wittnell's ligament into the muscular portion and dissecting, you may injure the superior rectus muscle. So the chance of injuring superior rectus muscle is real if you're doing supramaximal resection and you should be very careful when you're doing dissection posterior to the Wittnell's ligament. So what do you know about Wittnell's ligament itself? Subha? It's the superior, it's also called as a superior transverse uh, ligament. Mm. And uh, uh, that's it. Silence. Anybody wants to fill in? Ruju so, hasn't answered. Ruju? Do you want to answer? Just describe Wittnell's in a minute. Not five minutes, just a minute. Okay. Superior transverse ligament, that's where you stop. You can also say that it is condensation of facial sheath around the levator. It is around the levator. We only know that it is on the anterior surface, but it is also on the posterior surface. The anterior component of the witness ligament is more pronounced. Suppose this is the levator of neurosis. The anterior component is more pronounced. It is in the shape of a triangle or a pyramid. Posterior component is in the shape of a plaque. But it, it is like a sleeve around. Suppose this is the levator of neurosis vertically. This is like a sleeve around the levator of neurosis. The anterior component and this is the posterior component. The anterior component is more pronounced the posterior component is less well, less well pronounced. But it is seen as a very prominent white line in only about 40 to 50 percent of patients. In other patients, it may be seen as a very thin or a indistinct white line. It is not always very clear in all the patients. This is only by cadaver dissection this data has been generated. But whenever you do cadaver dissection, these patients tend to, tend to be elderly. So it is possible that Wittmann's ligament undergoes atrophy or some kind of involutionary, involutionary changes whenever you dissect or operate on an elderly individual. In younger patients, especially children, whenever we have done process surgery, we always realize that witness ligament is more pronounced and more prominent and thicker. Whereas in aponeurotic ptosis, whenever we have seen witness ligament, it is found to be less prominent and thinner. So possibly there is some involutional change that happens in witness ligament. There are two parts, typical superior transverse ligament and the posterior layer, which is connected to the conjoint ligament of SRLPS complex. And the posterior layer also sends fibers to the superior phonics and holds it steady and results in upward and downward movement of the superior phonics. This is just to show a picture of the Wittnell's ligament, just to show that it is somewhat relative to the junction of the transformation of the levator palpebrae superioris from the muscular portion to the oponeurotic portion, but it is not the boundary. This is no, Wittnell's is not within the levator palpebrae superioris. It is around it. It is attached to it, but it is not a direct or a distinct part of the levator palpebrae superioris. So you should not confuse that. And you should also not, just because you see Wittnell's, it doesn't mean that Oponeurotic portion has begun and muscular portion has ended. In, in this patient, you can see that in this picture, you can see that there is about two millimeter of muscular portion still extending ahead of the Wittnell's ligament. This is much more detailed view of the Wittnell's ligament. You can see that it is it has some elevation, 
which on cross section may look like a triangular or a pyramid or even look globular right and under that there is levator aponeurosis the function of the vitreal ligament is controversial it is supposed to be a pulley pivot or a fulcrum which transmits or transforms the horizontal uh, levator so in the orbit levator is nearly horizontal and when it comes to the lid it transforms its uh, configuration into vertical so if vitreal is here then it actually acts like a pulley to transfer the horizontal force into vertical that is one theory uh, which is not proven because vitreal is not exactly at the area where this change in direction contour direction of the levator happens so that is controversial that it is a check ligament is not controversial at all because it does hold levator in position change in vector is definitely controversial but in uh, practically whenever we do surgery if you have damaged the vitreal ligament it's always that the patient has undercurrent so it is possible that damage to the vitreal ligament will totally negate its function as a check ligament and second thing is that whenever we cut vitreal ligament lot of levator from the posterior aspect from the orbital component of the levator prolapses and your effect of surgery is much less you end up with under correction despite excessive resection so possibly it does act as a fulcrum or a pulley or a pivot so this is what i said damage to vitreals will prolapse the muscular part of the levator anteriorly and it will result in under correction and vitreal sling is a surgery where you sling the tarsus to the vitreal ligament or around the vitreal ligament taking suture around or through the vitreal ligament in patients who have severe ptosis and poor levator action who may not use frontalis either because they have deep amblyopia they may not have any stimulus to use frontalis or their frontalis function is poor so vitreal sling is a surgery that you can perform in patients who have poor levator action who are unlikely to use their frontalis now about the horns horns are the next component of the levator horns are strong elements especially the lateral horn it divides the lacrimal gland into orbital and the palpebral lobe it also sends lateral horn sends slip to slips to the lateral rectus fuses with the capsular palpebral fascia of the uh, lid and inserts through the lat lateral tubercle so medial horn is relatively weaker it blends with the orbital septum and inserts posterior to the posterior crest of the medial canthal tendon and the posterior lacrimal crest now the medial and the lateral horns are gently cut whenever we do levator resection if you don't cut the horns then the chance of down gaze lid lag and lag of thalamus will be slightly higher but you should not be too aggressive in cutting the horns especially when you cut the lateral horn especially when you cut the lateral horn your since the lacrimal gland will be right underneath your scissor should not be directed laterally scissor should be or whichever instrument that use rf electrode should be perpendicular if you direct it laterally then you may be damaging the lateral uh, part of the lacrimal gland and the medial horn is in relationship to the reflected portion of the superior oblique tendon so when you cut the medial horn if your instrument is directed medially then you may damage the reflected portion of the superior oblique tendon again when you cut the medial horn your scissor should be absolutely straight some advocate that in fact we really do it that we don't damage the horns at all we don't cut the horns at all especially when we do plication or reattachment we really don't cut the horns so that will give you better correction so if you don't cut the horns and then do surgery especially in vitreal sling you don't cut the horns at all you get a definitely much better correction in terms of the lift of the eyelid but with a component of down gaze lid lag and lag of thalamus so what is known about the horns is that it distributes forces of the levator to facilitate medial and lateral stability of the eyelid and a central lift in the lid the maximum lift happens slightly off center or center and it facilitates states that by anchoring the lid very nicely on the lateral side and not so nicely on the medial side so there is you must have seen that palpebral fissure slopes down laterally lateral stability is definitely there medially it is not so stable but nevertheless the central lift is very good because it distribute forces that way 
And the second component of horns is that functional component. It keeps the eyelid opposed to the cornea and aids in resurfacing of the tear film. So whenever you cut the horns in patients who have horizontal eyelid laxity or floppy eyelid syndrome, then the possibility of lid standoff or the posterior surface of the eyelid not touching the cornea is definitely there. These patients may also end up having ectropia. So whenever you have a patient who has floppy eyelid or horizontal upper eyelid laxity, then you should avoid cutting the horns to avoid this kind of a complication. Already mentioned that not cutting the horns may cause relatively more eyelid lag and lag of thalamus. And we also mentioned not to damage the lacrimal gland and reflected part of the superior oblique tendon while cutting the horns. These are the practical implications of the horns. Now about the aponeurotic component of the levator palpebris superioris. Let me just check the time. Are we on time? I don't want to take too much time mm -hmm. for this. Yeah, it's 7.45. Okay. The aponeurosis is single layer in Caucasians. Most of the Caucasian dissection studies have shown that levator palpebris superioris aponeurosis is single layer. But most of the Asian studies have shown that it may split into anterior and posterior layer. Three to four millimeter below the upper edge of the tarsus and send slips to orbicularis and indirectly attached to skin to form the upper eyelid crease. So it uh, sends slips to the orbicularis and indirectly attaches to the skin to form the upper eyelid crease. This is the anterior layer. On elevation of the upper eyelid, these slips retract the skin muscle to prevent the overhang. That is one of the functions of the lid crease. Now, whenever there is dehiscence or disinsertion of the levator palpebris superioris, the lid crease moves higher up. That's one of the indications that the patient has either disinsertion of the levator palpebris superioris or a dehiscence. And it comes forward to attach to the upper border and anterior surface of the tarsus. And on the anterior surface of the tarsus, at least three to four millimeter is covered. Sometimes it may go right down to the level of the lower eyelid, lower tarsal margin. So it is kind of creeping on the anterior surface of the tarsus. At least three to four millimeter of the tarsus gets covered by the aponeurotic component that we have seen during surgery. So especially for postgraduates, this is a common question. What are the five insertions of the levator palpebris superioris? Already mentioned all this upper phonics for sure by slips of the conjoint ligament. It holds the upper phonics in position. Change in direction of the fibers indicates that we are nearing the upper phonics, especially when we are separating conjunctiva from the levator aponeurosis. You have to be careful there. Medial horn, through that, it uh, kind of gets attached to the medial canthal tendon and the posterior lacrimal crest. Through the lateral horn, it gets attached to the lateral tubercle. This stabilizes the levator and facilitates central lift, while the medial and lateral part of the lids do lift, but not so much as uh, in relative to the central lift. It gets attached to the skin indirectly through slips, which travels through the orbicularis, forming the eyelid crease. And it also gets attached to the upper edge and the anterior surface of the tarsal plate. This is the five attachments of the, or insertions of the levator palpebris superioris. Now, analogous to the levator palpebris superioris in the lower eyelid, we have capsulopalpebral fascia. It is the lower lid retractor. It arises definitely from the inferior rectus and also has attachment to the Lockwood ligament and capsule of the inferior rectus and also inferior oblique. And wherever it is associated firmly with the inferior rectus, that's called the head of the capsulopalpebral fascia, simply called the capsulopalpebral head. It is not a nodular structure, but it is a placard structure where it originates from the inferior rectus. And it fuses with the orbital septum four to five millimeter below the tarsus in Caucasians. But practically, whenever we have done lower lid entropion surgery, Jones procedure, we have realized that this attachment is, if at all, very flimsy. In fact, orbital septum can be easily recessed from the detached lower lid retractor. So this attachment may be there, but it is very flimsy and there is a plane of separation between the orbital septum and the capsulopalpebral head of the inferior rectus muscle. And this is, a uh, this is of practical importance because whenever we reattach 
lower lid retractor to the lower edge of the tarsus, we expect the septum to be separated. Otherwise, you will carry the septum along with the lower lid retractor to the lower edge of the tarsus, causing bulkiness of the lower eyelid. Patient will not be happy with it. This conjoint insertion of the lower to the lower border of the tarsus and the anterior surface of the tarsus. This is what is described in the book. Again, practically, whenever we do lower lid uh, entropion surgery, we find that conjoint insertion is really not there. Septum is still in its position and the lower lid retractor would have got disinserted from the lower border of the tarsus. So we find the septum very much in position at the lower border of the tarsus while the retractor would have got disinserted. That means that they separately insert to the lower border and the lower surface of the tarsus. It does send slips to the inferior fornix and skin causing a faint but definitely a lower lid crease and also holds the inferior fornix in position. It also sends a medial slip to the medial canthal tendon which continues as the honus muscles to attach to the posterior lacrimal crest which works for the lacrimal pump mechanism. So whenever a patient has lower lid laxity, the lacrimal pump may mechanism may get attenuated or it may become weak. This is a cadaveric dissection of the lower lid retractor. This is the inferior rectus muscle and this is called the capsulopalpebral head, a placoid thickening at the junction of the inferior rectus and the origin of the lower lid retractor. Now, just like the levator, it may have two layers one of which is this is the anterior layer and you can also see a posterior layer. So exactly like levator, it may have two layers, especially in Asians. And this diagram also depicts that there are two layers. You can see capsulopalpebral fascia, this is the anterior layer, this is the posterior layer, and this is the, there are actually slips are missing, the slips to the inferior phonics. No uh, in clinical implication of capsulopalpebral fascia are that higher position of the lower lid and a deep inferior fornix indicate that lower lid retractors are dehiscent or weak, especially in a patient with lower lid entropion. If you find that the lower lid is covering the lower limbers or higher than the lower limbers, that means lower lid position is higher. That's also called inverse dosis of the lower eyelid and the deep inferior fornix. Then there is possibly cap. Uh, sorry, there should be shallow inferior phonix, then it is possibly a disinsertion of the palpable fascia. In lower lid retraction, uh, especially following inferior rectus recession, capsulopalpable fascia is definitely involved. Whenever there is inferior rectus recession surgery performed, there is lower lid retraction. That's because along with inferior rectus recession, capsulopalpable fascia also get recessed. So squint surgeon should take care of it. They should separate the inferior rectus from the cap capsulopalpebral fascia very gently and reattach it. That prevents lower lid retraction in patients who undergo inferior rectus recession. And also in patients who have uh, skin approach to the orbital floor, especially orbital floor fracture or orbitotomy, there is lower lid retraction. That's because they suture the septum and also they suture the lower lid retractor as before they suture the skin. So whenever you do a skin approach to the orbital floor, you should not suture the septum at all and you may not even suture the lower lid retractor, especially if you have left the medial and the lateral aspect of the lower lid retractor attached, it will still work stabilizing the lower eyelid and these patients generally don't tend to have lower lid entropion. The etiology of involutional entropion and tarsal entropion and the role of cap capsulopalpebral fascia is very well known. Disinsertion or dehiscence of this capsulopalpebral fascia results in involutional entropion. The treatment would be plication or reinsertion. Tarsal ectropion also is supposed to result from the same mechanism of disinsertion associated with horizontal laxity of the lower eyelid. This is just a picture to show uh, the uh, lower lid retractor along with inferior tarsal muscle. Now about the tarsus just a little bit. It is the skeleton of the eyelid. It's nothing but dense fibrous tissue simulating cartilage but it is really not cartilage. It is curved to the contour of the cornea so that the opposition of the eyelid to the uh, anterior surface of the cornea is real and here is resurfaced well. 
length is about 22 to 28 millimeter. The average length is about 25 millimeter. The height ranges 8 to 12 millimeter in the upper eyelid, shorter in orientals and shorter in female gender and children, of course, 3 to 5 millimeter in the lower eyelid. And its terminal portions, medial and lateral terminal portions have a very thin tarsus that is about 2 millimeter. There are about 20 to 25 meibomian glands, more in the upper eyelid about 25 and less in the lower eyelid about 20. In dystichiasis especially, there is regressive metaplasia of a specialized sebaceous gland back into pilosebaceous unit. So whenever you find that there are lash follicles at the meibomian gland orifices, especially in patients who have congenital or acquired dystichiasis. That means that there is regressive metaplasia of sebaceous glands into pilosebaceous units. Uh, next bit is about innervation. Going quickly because we are running short of time. Sensory innervation of the upper eyelid. From, this is from lateral to medial, zygomatic or temporal, lacrimal, supraorbital, supratrochlear and extreme medial actually supplied by the infratrochlear as well. In the lower eyelid, again from lateral to medial, it's zygomatico-facial, infraorbital and infratrochlear. So you look at the nerve distribution, you see that this is the zygomatico-temporal nerve, supraorbital nerve, supratrochlear nerve and that is the, what nerve is that? Where the arrow is pointing, that's the frontal nerve, right? So whenever we give a frontal block, as we call it in tosis surgery or any surgery that we do for the upper eyelid, we are actually not anesthetizing the frontal nerve. We are not going that deep. We are only giving a supraorbital nerve block because we are only going about 1 to 1.5 centimeter deep. A little deeper is also fine but we are not really anesthetizing the frontal nerve. But the point where it divides is very variable. So our depth is always standard. Sometimes the nerve may divide more anteriorly. Sometimes the nerve may divide more posteriorly. Depending on that, the anesthesia may be more profound. But our idea is to anesthetize both the supraorbital and the supratrochlear nerve. So by depositing anesthesia here, it has the potential to anesthetize, anesthetize both the components. And when you anesthetize this, the anesthesia extends right up to the lambdoid suture. So any supra-bro surgery or any surgery in the forehead can easily be carried out by giving a supraorbital nerve block or the frontal block. Now that is the infratrochlear nerve, but you can see that the infratrochlear nerve also anesthetize, also has a sensation, carry sensation to the extreme medial component of the upper eyelid along with extreme medial component of the lower eyelid as well. And this is the infraorbital nerve. Whenever you give infraorbital nerve anesthesia, we go about four to five millimeter below the inferior orbital margin, palpate for that notch. And the moment you find the notch, it is palpable in, especially in patients who are not too bulky. Otherwise you can just go by the measurement and anatomical landmarks and inject in that area so that you get anesthesia of the lower eyelid and the cheek region. This is zygomaticofacial nerve. Generally, we don't have to anesthetize, but zygomaticofacial and zygomaticotemporal nerves get severed when you do lateral orbitotomy or orbital decompression. So the patient may end up having semi-permanent or permanent anesthesia of the lateral aspect of the eyelid and the temporal area because you have damaged these two nerves during orbitotomy, which is deliberate because without cutting these, we may not get access to the entire lateral orbit, especially while doing decompression. And for lateral orbitotomy, definitely zygomatico temporal nerve has to be cut, otherwise you cannot go really deeper. So these two nerves get damaged during these surgeries. This is to show in a cadaveric dissection the vertical orientation of the nerves from the infraorbital nerve. So infraorbital nerve has this kind of medusa head appearance. It exits here, but also has these vertical branches that go to supply the lower eyelid. So sometimes the question or the confusion is that if you give block to the infraorbital nerve, would it just be a downstream block? Does it, does it mean that the lower lid does not get anesthetized. That's really not so because when you block it, you see that in 
you can see that the fibers are actually going up vertically. So when you block it here, the entire region gets anesthetized. It's not just the downstream block. About the motor innovation, orbicularis gets innovated by temporal and zygomatic branch of the frontal nerve. Corrugator supercilii has dual innovation, temporal and also angular nerve. Procerus gets innovated from the angular nerve. Levator, superior division of the oculomotor nerve and lower lid retractor from the inferior division of the oculomotor nerve. Mullers and inferior tarsal muscles have sympathetic innervations. This is just to show the innervation of the orbicularis, zygomatic and the temporal branch of the facial nerve innervate the orbicularis. And you can also see that the buccal nerve continues here and that is actually precursor of the angular nerve. Angular nerve originates from the buccal branch of the facial nerve. And you can see that it is going medially to supply corrugator supercilii and procerus. These are some of the variations in nerve supply. Not very relevant, but if you're doing facelift, etc., and if you're doing lateral dissection, then some of these may become relevant. Otherwise, you may cause anesthesia or echinacea in, uh, without any, uh, with, by causing damage to these nerves, sensory and motor. Now, blood supply. Blood supply to the, can you describe this? Let me have the pleasure of asking you. We have discussed this so many times during surgery. So can you please describe this? To break the monotony. Hmm. The, main, uh, the main supply of the eyelid is ophthalmic artery, hmm. uh, uh, which is from the internal carotid artery. So we have two arcades, uh, which we should know anatomically, which is the marginal arcade and the peripheral arcade. Okay. Marginal arcade lies two mil millimeters above the lid margin and as it's shown here uh, it's the terminal branch of the ophthalmic arteries that is the medial palpable artery mm -hmm. and the lateral palpable artery will basically form the uh, superior marginal arcade which is two okay. millimeters above the upper lid okay where exactly is it located between, between, between which layer is the orbicularis uh, and the tarsus mm -hmm. orbicularis and the tarsus hmm? mullers and the that Superior arcade is located between the Mullers and the ah, yes, sir. yes, sir. The peripheral arcade, yes, sir. Superior peripheral arcade. Yeah. The marginal is between the tarsus and the orbicularis. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then they are interconnected by these vertical channels. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. whenever you do suborbicularis dissection, these vertical blood vessels should be kept with the orbicularis and you should not go in the plane because then there will be incessant bleeding and you may have to cauterize a lot. That is one of the implications. Right? Mm. And what is the next? What about superior palpebral artery and how does it supply the eyelid? Is there something called a preceptal arcade? This is the preceptal arcade. So superior palpebral artery you can see runs horizontally like that, correct? Mm. And it gives these vertical branches which divide. Some of these are terminal branches which are above the septum. So whenever you do suborbicularis dissection, sometimes you encounter this and you pre cauterize it. So when you open the septum, you have to be careful not to damage any of these vessels. And if these vessels are formed in the area where you're going to open the septum, you have to pre cauterize otherwise it will start bleeding. So medial palpable artery is nothing but the terminal branch of ophthalmic artery. It comes from the medial side. And lateral palpable arteries are branches of the lacrimal artery, which is the terminal branch of the uh, ophthalmic artery. Okay. From the internal carotid system. Lac lacrimal artery is a branch of? Ophthalmic artery. Is there any internal carotid, external carotid anastomosis in the eyelid? Yes, there is. Uh, where is that? Uh, the supraorbital and the supratrochlea mm -hmm. and the dorsal nasal uh, branches. Uh, so, uh, there are so many of these. 
this is from Harris dissection work. You can see that internal carotid system and the external carotid system have a lot of communications around the eyelid. So that makes the eyelid extremely vascular. As you rightly said, lacrimal artery is a branch of internal carotid artery, but it can have anastomosis with any of these. You can see hugely anastomosed with the supply from the external carotid artery. So this is something that is very unique to the eyelid because it is extremely vascular and there is a lot of points of anastomosis between the internal carotid and the external carotid artery. That is the reason there is excellent wound healing in the eyelid. Even if some part of the eyelid looks devitalized during uh, say repair of eyelid, laceration, etc., it heals beautifully well. So there is no point sacrificing what looks devitalized unless it's really come off. You simply suture it back in position and that will heal. Designing flaps in the eyelid is also very interesting because these flaps do have a good blood supply and they take up very well without much scarring or contraction. And if you know the blood supply, especially this arterial supply, if you remember this particular picture, then you can design your incisions in such a way or you can dissect in such a way that intraoperative bleeding is much less. So you should always remember what is the normal anatomy of the arterial arcade around the eyelid so that you can make your incisions to avoid these areas if possible or dissect in the plane that these blood vessels don't get damaged and minimize intraoperative bleeding. Veins also follow exactly a similar system. This is the venous drainage of the orbit. Can you describe this Subha? I'm showing you a picture which is very descriptive anyway. Do you want to verbalize this? Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The supraorbital and the uh, supratrochlear and the superior ophthalmic vein, the confluence of which forms the angular vein. Correct. The angular vein lies in relation to the uh, medial canthal ligament, about six to eight millimeters from the uh, medial canthus. Uh, and medial to the medial canthus. Medial to the medial canthus, and we should be careful about it while doing our uh, incisions in BCR surgery. Okay. Uh, um, because your incision in the DCR surgery is along the anterior lacrimal crest. And the entire flap will come in the catchpore retractor. So you will not even see the angular vein. Right? So yeah. you don't cut it. You don't tend to cut it as long as your incision is along the anterior lacrimal crest or the lower eyelid crease. Okay. What about uh, this? So you, can you start by uh, talking about you know, the anastomosis of, or which, which is the tributary of which vein and finally what happens? Is there any connection to the superior ophthalmic vein? Is there any connection to the cavernous sinus? Practical implications. Yes, sir. the veins of the face per se are valveless mm -hmm. and uh, the superior palpebral vein drains into the supraorbital vein, supraorbital and the supratrochlear veins, they drain into the superior ophthalmic vein. Superior ophthalmic vein further continues to drain into the cavernous sinus. And thereby, and also the superficial plexus of veins have a deeper plexus with the pterygoid plexus. So in such a way that uh, any infection in the face, because it is a valveless channel, can be carried on to the cavernous sinus, leading to cavernous sinus thrombosis or possibly spread of infection. Yeah, you it, it explained it adequately, but wherever there is this confluence of supraorbital and supratrochlear, there are two deeper venous, venous communications that are channelized. One is superior root of the superior ophthalmic vein and the inferior root of the superior ophthalmic vein. Inferior root of the superior ophthalmic vein is infratrochlear, whereas superior root of the supra, superior ophthalmic vein is supratrochlear, and they are generated close to the confluence of the supratrochlear and the supraorbital vein. So these are deeper venous communications and they directly go into the superior ophthalmic vein. And uh, since these veins are valveless, there is a uh, possibility of tra transmission of infection to the deeper channels and also cavernous sinus thrombosis. Superficial to deep anastomosis is something that you have to be worried about because this is a like a highway carrying infection. So 
this in a dangerous area of the face does not extend to the lower eyelid or upper eyelid but since these areas are also quite risky any infection in these areas should be treated adequately what about lymphatics what do you know about lymphatics of the eyelid tuju has not answered anything so she should possibly tuju ji is she online mm, yes yeah talk about lymphatics sir it drains Hmm. You want a picture? Not sure. Hmm. Hmm. So, uh, later. Is this as simple as this? This is standard one. textbook description, isn't it? Medial yes. part of the upper eyelid and the medial one third of the upper eyelid and the medial two thirds of the lower eyelid drain to submandibular nodes. Lateral two thirds of the upper eyelid and lateral one third of the lower eyelid drain to preauricular <laughs> parotid, right? But this is not as simple as this because currently what is understood is that each layer can have a different lymphatic drainage, especially on the medial half of the upper eyelid, skin and the conjunctiva. Drain into different groups of lymph nodes, so it is not even as crisp as this diagram shows. It is quite complicated, so it is really very simple to depict it in this fashion. This is good for postgraduate students, but as a fellow, you should know that it is more intricate. Although this is a very simple depiction, it may be as intricate as this, or even more intricate. This there are no boundaries actually. and you should actually examine the entire spectrum of lymph nodes in a patient who has an eyelid tumor not just the group that you think it would drain to so that's the last slide as is your anatomy so is your surgery so you should invest a lot of time in reading and understanding anatomy so that when you actually do surgery on a patient it becomes fairly predictive anatomy itself has lot of variations patient to patient variations bilateral variations but if you know the classic anatomy at least and a range of variations you would be able to expect that in a given patient during surgery and prevent some of the um, that inadvertent damage to the nerves or bleeding or explain to the patient that these are the side effects that are possible and of course optimize your results as well thank you so much thank you so much sir uh those who are on the zoom platform i think we'll